Okay, we'll start with this. The answer to a question I posed a few days ago, when news broke that Dillian White had tested positive for a third time. Eddie Hearn is distancing himself from White's drug testing scandal. I don't know him well enough. A very different tune this time than what we heard the last time when Dillian White tested positive for a banned substance ahead of the Oscar Rivas fight. Eddie stood by him then. Doesn't look like he's gonna do that now. There were quite a few differences between Ben and White's situations. Firstly, the tests. What? The results and the substances were very different. Secondly, the conversations between the teams were very different. Ben versus Eubank was a co-promotion. AJ versus White was a pure matchroom promotion, Hearn told Talk Sport. Eubank's team wanted to investigate the situation further, and after taking medical advice, they were willing to proceed with the bout subject to what the British Boxing Board of Control had to say. In this instance, AJ and his team looked at the results and wanted to terminate the contract immediately. If anybody out there is wondering, why did Eddie Hearn stand by Conor Ben, and why does he not seem to want to stand by Dillian White? You know, for Conor Ben, that was the first time Conor Ben had ever tested positive for a banned substance. And depending on what that substance was, there might actually be an explanation. Whereas for Dillian White, this is the third time, not the first. At this point, it just comes off as pattern behavior. I don't think you can give him the benefit of the doubt. Eddie Hearn has supported Ben aggressively throughout his fight to clear his name, but the veteran promoter will not be involved in White's upcoming battle. Firstly, I don't represent Dillian, so I can't talk on his behalf. What I can say is, I am surprised and I am in shock. He has employed VADA testing meticulously over his career. I had an email as early as this morning from his team to say there is a strict confidentiality on his behalf not on my behalf, and he's got a big, big fight on his hands, Hearn said. We'll let him go through that process and see how it pursues. But I was in shock. On Saturday, when we found out, I was definitely surprised, and he's got a tough road ahead. Three separate occasions in the sport of boxing, Dillian White has tested positive for a banned substance, and where Eddie Hearn might have given him the benefit of the doubt the last time, he's all out of lifelines. I think that because of Eddie's long-standing relationship, his commitment to Anthony Joshua and promoting his fights... Why? In this instance, he has to draw a line in the sand. He didn't have to do that before because Oscar Rivas, Oscar wasn't his fighter. There's no relationship to salvage. To prioritize. I don't know Dillian White necessarily well enough. I haven't looked into the science enough. I would like to think that he is innocent because I don't like the fact that he would have tried to gain an advantage in this fight. But we also cannot ignore the situation, Hearn said. This is the third drug testing scandal in White's career. When he was banned for two years in connection to a positive test back in 2012 and he also tested positive for a banned substance in 2019 but was ultimately cleared of those charges by UCAT. Perhaps not this time. Eddie Hearn doesn't want to touch this thing and he likely doesn't want to go up to bat for Dillian White because of his relationship with Anthony Joshua. If nothing else, you must consider that as well as this being the third time Dillian has tested positive for something. Yeah. He can't explain it away anymore. Hey. Anthony Joshua chimed in on the whole thing saying, it's funny. The two people who have accused me have popped dirty themselves. Jarrell Miller tested positive more than once. Dillian White as well. These two fighters, these two in particular, were quite adamant, quite vocal, that they believed Anthony Joshua was using banned substances just for banned substances to be found in their systems. That's called projecting. When pressed on how serious he believes the doping problem is in boxing, Joshua said, I can't speak on the numbers. I don't really mix inside the boxing industry. I don't know, but it's a problem. There is a doping problem in the sport, definitely. I don't think we need just longer bans. I think we need to look at it at the root. I don't know the solution, but I always mind my P's and Q's because I don't want my reputation damaged. What it does. Seems that both Dillian White and Jarrell Miller have something in common. They hate Anthony Joshua, one, and they one, have both one, accused one. him of using banned substances only for them to be caught 
red-handed too more than once beyond reproach different people got different takes on doping in the sport of boxing i happen to think it's more widespread than people realize and just because fighters don't get caught don't mean they ain't using something the veil set before the boxing community at large and what's on the other side of it may be jarring if it all were to come out who knows who's doping who knows who isn't i have a long history of being drug tested and sometimes you have to question the person who keeps pointing the finger it's funny that the two people who have accused me have popped dirty themselves. Maybe they did it because of my physique or my success, my rise. It maybe didn't make sense to them, but it's God gifted and a lot of hard work. Like I said, that's called projecting. I get drug tested all year round. Every quarter, I have to submit my whereabouts, where I am going to be every day for an hour of the day so they can turn up randomly. I have submitted that every day of my life since 2011. Projecting is the byproduct of a guilty conscience. The individual tells himself that if I'm doing this, other people must be doing it too, and suddenly they start making baseless accusations they can't verify. All they know is they're on something, and that makes them suspicious of everyone else. Anthony Joshua says sometimes you have to question the person pointing the finger. Floyd Mayweather Jr. almost immediately comes to mind, and the baseless accusations he made about Manny Pacquiao years ago. The defamation suit that followed. And the out-of-court settlement, Floyd had to pay Manny Pacquiao for that defamation. The baseless accusations he made about Manny that were never substantiated. The baseless accusations he's now making about Naoya Inoue, insinuating that he's a dirty fighter. I mean, it's really not dissimilar from what both Jarrell Miller and Dillian White were doing when it comes to Anthony Joshua, accusing him of using banned substances just for them to get caught. They were projecting their inadequacies onto someone else, kind of like how Floyd... Floyd might be projecting his inadequacies onto Manny Pacquiao, onto Naoya Inoue, because why does he immediately jump to that conclusion without any evidence of it? Maybe he heard some rumors. The rumors in and of themselves don't explain how adamant he was when it came to Manny, and he might be a little bit more careful with his words when it comes to Naoya Inoue, but the implications of what he's been saying equate to the same thing. Think about Jarrell Miller, Dillian White. How else can you describe their situations as nothing short of deliberate? You guys were deliberately taking something, I mean. And if you're deliberately taking something, why is it so important to you to cast an air of suspicion and an air of doubt over someone else? Is it because you want to bring them down to your level so that people might think of them the same way they might think of you if they knew? what you were up to, what you were doing. Seems more and more like a guilty conscience, projecting what character flaws and inadequacies they might have onto others as to cope. Deal with the fear that at some point they're going to be exposed, they're going to be found out. The sport of boxing is rife with doping and doping scandals, so much so that you can be suspicious of virtually anyone. No one is immune. But it does seem like those who are most vocal and most quick to point the finger are the ones that end up having all the explaining to do. Is that a coincidence? So Anthony Joshua had his fair bit to say about Dillian White. He added, he wants to build momentum for Wilder, for Fury. Inactivity makes you soft. Inactivity is something we often talk about here on the channel, especially when it comes to PBC fighters. Stephen Fulton's inactivity ahead of the Inui fight. Spence's inactivity ahead of the Crawford fight. Wilder's, what could be Wilder's inactivity ahead of a Joshua fight. Of course, Jermel Charlo's inactivity ahead of the Canelo fight. Anthony Joshua stated, I looked at the momentum I need, even if I I am going to fight in December. I need to build momentum. I kind of canceled the end of the year fight for now. Looking back at previous negotiations with leading heavyweights in the division, it's always been complicated. Back and forths and never materialized. Since 2019, this is the first time I'm having multiple fights in the same year. Crazy. That's not good for any fighter. Inactivity is not good. Look, my last fight with Jermaine Franklin, a unanimous decision win in April, no knockout. Maybe not the most spectacular performance but at least I'm starting to get active again. The more you do something, the better you become at it. The situational awareness that comes with constantly being in the trenches, getting out there under those hot lights, and the poise that develops over time. Calm. Control. Not as much nervous energy when you're fighting in sequence, when you're fighting on a regular basis. No long layoffs, long stretches. No lulls in activity. Because you're fighting on a regular basis, you feel at home in the ring. Maybe you don't even notice 
miss the crowd. Maybe not. Fighting once a year, you become soft. You're not as tough as you once were, so I am getting that battle skin back. <laughs> that will be really good for me. If I win in spectacular fashion, it's a massive confidence booster. It gives me and trainer Derek James more bonding time as we perfect our craft. It's what I am supposed to be doing as a warrior on a battlefield, conquering. I'm living my dream. Now, some feel that Derek James, you know, Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence Jr.'s fight two weeks ago has exposed. Some people feel that Derek James failed to prepare Errol from that fight. Personally, I think they're being too hard on Derek James and not considerate enough of Terrence Crawford. This is no ordinary welterweight, no ordinary welterweight champion. No ordinary champion. It took people long enough to catch up, but this is one of the pound for pound best fighters in the sport, and in my humble opinion, a generational talent. Derek's fighter losing to Terrence doesn't mean that Derek is a bad trainer. Perhaps he had the wrong approach. But what might be wrong for one might not be wrong for some. A man is born. Derek seems to rely on the physical more than the mental. He's a man of means and along came to. Most will highlight Derek James and how dismissive he was of Terrence Crawford's ambidextrous switch hitting, his more cerebral approach to the sport as opposed to Errol's more physical. Errol was too simple for Terrence and that's all well and good. I've spent the last five years telling you that. Derek's preparations for Errol Spence Jr.'s fights, most of them, seems to rely on the physical, and that's all well and good. Maybe they miscalculated with Terrence, but for Anthony Joshua, being a little bit more physical is just what the doctor ordered, because Anthony Joshua's meteoric rise was on the heels of him being one of the best finishers in the division, a talented knockout merchant. Some would say that... After his shock upset loss to Andy Ruiz, he became more cerebral because he became more tentative, afraid to let his hands go for fear of being countered the way he was countered in the first Ruiz fight. I hope I can bring an exciting style. I feel that I had to go through this process. I really need August 12th for everything that I have gone through to merge together and bring back an exciting performance. A knockout is needed. I agree, said Joshua. Active fighters, we're all fighting once a year now. I don't know what it is. The networks might be paying too much. I just need to get busy again. Derek's approach may be too simple for a fighter like Terrence Crawford, but it might not be too simple for a heavyweight. The majority of heavyweights, these are not the most cerebral fighters you know. I mean, at heavyweight, you really are always one punch away from being knocked out. And Anthony Joshua, he does have power in both hands. He's got a strong right hand, but a good left hook. Some people think he's got a glass jaw, but need I remind you that Deontay Wilder's been knocked down and knocked out more times than Anthony. Perception can be funny like that. I still feel that Derek James is the right fit for Anthony Joshua, and I still feel that he can bring back a more offensively minded Anthony Joshua than the one we've been seeing. The one who was more focused on being a boxer than being a puncher, when being a puncher is what got him to those alphabet titles. It's all about timing. Anthony's previous attempts to become a more cerebral fighter, a more mental fighter, were not in vain. Perhaps that is something that he can use on some other occasion. When he wants to be, he's actually a very strong finisher, and a lot of people would like to see him get back to that. Talk about an activity, Anthony Joshua hit the nail on the head. Far too many fighters have been relegated to fighting just twice a year or once or every leap year. It's got a lot to do with what fighters want to get paid for a fight as well as the availability of fight dates, network budgets, what's available, what makes sense and what doesn't. There are a lot of moving parts. So it always rings true is an active fighter, a busy fighter, busy fighter makes for a sharp fighter. This is going to be the first time in a long time that Anthony Joshua has fought two times in the same calendar year. He needs to finish big this weekend. He needs to put this guy away and move on. Keep the momentum going. Finally, one guy, one guy who's lost considerable momentum from when last we saw him, Jermel Charlo. Jermel Charlo who warns Canelo is going to see what Lions only is all about. The reigning undisputed champion down there at junior middleweight aspires to become a two-weight undisputed champion. I'm really excited to make history once again on September 30th, said Chulo. This is the biggest fight in boxing, and I'm coming to leave it all in the ring like I do every time. I manifested this fight into existence and earned it with everything I've done in this sport so far. Canelo is a great fighter, but he's going to see what Lions Only is all about. When the fight is over, people are going to have to recognize that I'm the best fighter 
in the sport, achieving that goal, becoming a two-weight undisputed champion, jumping up two weight classes to do it, would be a monumental feat. Jermel Charlo's inactivity after the Brian Castaño fight going into this one is a serious stumbling block. Not to be overlooked, Jermel Charlo's best bet is to use his height, use his length, and use his legs to create space against the shorter, stumpier fighter with the heavier feet to set up punches, use the jab, to manage the distance, to set up the backhand, you need that jab to be snappy, you need that jab to be crisp, and after over a year of inactivity and coming off an injury reportedly, you still want to believe that, even if you don't believe that Jermel Charlo was injured, even if you believe that he was really just waiting out Tim Zhu, even if you don't believe that the injury was real, the time off was, time off? Affects your timing, affects your sharpness, your reflexes. Now, Jermel Charlo's got a big enough frame to really fill out as a super middleweight, but at super middleweight, he's not fighting just any old body. He's fighting that division's undisputed champion who has been more active in the last 12 months than he has fully acclimated and accustomed to fighting other super middleweights, whereas Jermel is just now moving up. Took him long enough. Previous segment, we talked about how in Anthony Joshua's own words, inactivity is not good for fighters. Jermel Charlo just so happens to be his stablemate. They share the same trainer, Derek James. Getting into a gunfight with Canelo, that can't be the way to go. Trying to match his power blow for blow, mid-range to inside. Jermel must rely on his physical gifts, his height, his length, and his mobility, his best weapons in this match. Being out for so long and carrying more weight into a fight than he's ever carried into any fight might take something off his timing, might take something off his punches. They won't be as sharp, won't be as crisp. Perhaps he'll feel good in the beginning, in the first couple of rounds, say the first and second quarter, but in the third. You know, because he didn't have to boil down to 154 for this fight didn't leave as much of himself in the camp. He has more of himself to bring to the fight, though when it comes to the fight, fight this is fight, a guy who fight. needed two fights with Tony Harrison to get one decisive victory. This is a guy who needed two fights with Brian Castaño. Same deal. Many people feel that he lost the first one, but he definitely won the second. Better still, he needed two fights with Brian to get one decisive victory, and none of those fighters, none, none of those champions are of the ilk. None are the caliber of a Canelo Alvarez. I think that Jermel Charlo possesses certain ingredients to make things interesting at the start, but I am not confident that he will still be standing at the finish. I believe he will be the next one of Derek James's fighters to suffer a professional loss. That's what I think. I think this might be a rough year, a rough year for Derek James, the two-time trainer of the year in previous years, this one. It's gonna be tough. Many are pointing to Canelo Alvarez's performance in the John Ryder fight, the last fight that he had earlier this year and how he looked. Well, maybe Canelo doesn't think of a John Ryder the same way he thinks of a Jermel Charlo. Maybe Canelo isn't as ambitious opposite the ring that guy as he might be with this one. And he still dominated him. He still dropped him two times and won practically every single round. That's what he did to John Ryder. A more acclimated fighter to super middleweight than Jermel. Sorry to say that Jermel Charlo's aspirations of becoming a two-time undisputed champion. Against one of the best chins in boxing? Against one of the best boxers in the entire sport? No, I don't think it happens.